This is Hannah Bull here in Hamilton, Ontario with Davey Boy Smith Jr., two-time WWE Tag Team Champion, three-time IWGP New Japan Pro Wrestling Tag Team Champion. He was just victorious in a match here in Hamilton. As you can see, he's all sweated up, looking pumped. Uh, how was your match tonight? Uh, yes, Hannibal, thank you very much for having me back on here. And it's always great being back in Ontario, and it was nice being back in Hamilton. Uh, Ethan Page put on a very good, uh, very pro professional uh, production tonight. And it's, I'm glad to be back, and I hope to come back soon. Well, you're going to be back in Ontario That's October right. 20th, facing either Jeremy Prophet or Nathan Banner for the, the Hannibal TV title. So yeah. we're looking forward to that. Absolutely. I can't wait for it. Um, Jeremy Prophet and I, we were supposed to wrestle at your first event like uh was that two years ago or was that a year yeah, ago cage wars yeah. yeah and i think that he's a hell of a talent nathan banner is a hell of a talent too so i'm looking forward to it and uh, i understand you're going to be facing teddy hart as well i'm facing teddy all Hart. Right. actually before that i'm facing ming Haku okay on yeah the you're on. i want to see that <laughs> and actually speaking of the last time you wrestled for great north wrestling you defeated maximum testosterone mm -hmm. he's getting a wwe tryout uh in august yeah so. that's great uh I hope that he does well. He's a big guy. They need big guys. He showed me a lot of heart in our match and the uh, training seminar we did earlier on in the day. Um, I guess time will tell and hopefully he gets a shot and he gets an opportunity, but I think that there's a good chance he'll get picked up. Now, the reason I came out here today, uh, other than it's always great to see you, is you left New Japan recently, which yep. shocked a lot of people. Do you want to explain to us uh, why exactly you made that choice? Yeah, you know, um, there was, unfortunately, I was in a situation where I almost couldn't win. Uh, New Japan, towards the end, they were only giving me four tours a year. And what they had told me or expressed to me was that there was no way that they could increase the workload of KES, Lance Archer, and myself as a tag team. And there has been a lot of things that happened before this that I'll try to cover as much as I can here. But I had my back against the wall and it was a business decision that I had to make for my future. And I felt that the tag team with Lance Archer and myself had expired. And we did all that we could in Japan um, and in the USA because we're just not very well known over here or, or here or Canada as a tag team. And you know, there was issues with the Booker Gato and myself, and I'm happy to go over all that right now. Um, I guess this will all date back to when Lance Archer had hurt his back um, on a New Japan tour, I believe it was March of 2017. And believe me, when Archer and myself returned back to New Japan after our two year stint in NOAA, I myself was very, very fired up, pumped up, ready to come back, take New Japan by storm. I had done a really crazy diet during that time. Like I'll tell you, I didn't even have a Diet Coke for about a month. Uh, absolutely no crap, nothing. I was lean cut down to about 248. Really, really happy to be back in New Japan. And unfortunately, as luck has it, you know, Lance Archer got injured. Finally, I guess it was the straw that broke the camel's back at Corican Hall. He had to get emergency back surgery over in New Japan. I was told that I was going to be, I was on the, the rest of the remainder of that tour, and I was told by the new person in the office named Saito that I was going to be on the next tour, and that was about a oh, little over four weeks, and he gave me a schedule. I wasn't on the Super Juniors tour. Um, I think I was on something in June. So when I went home, I was actually, you know, I, they had owed me merchandise money from that tour. And they said, okay, you're coming back next month. They said, yeah, I'll be back here, you know, okay. So I went home and I was waiting for my flight and nobody gave me any flight information. I sent Kamiko, the office lady, an email and said, you know, where's my flight? And she goes, well, did you talk to Gato, San or Hattori? You're not on the tour. And I said, well, that's news to me because I was told that I am. And not only that, I was told I was on the tour, the full tour, which was over a month long. So uh, I tried to send Gato a Facebook message because that's how him and uh, Lance Hoyt communicate. And Lance sends him ideas. 
So I got on Facebook, I had sent Gato a message. Um, he never even read it or responded. I spoke to Hattori who luckily had the balls enough to call me back and he said, we're sorry. He put it on this office person named Saito that it was his fault that he told me that I was on the tour and I wasn't. I just would have appreciated them to be honest with me and when I was going home if they said, hey listen, Lance, he's going to be out for however long. We don't have anything for you because you guys are a tag team. We're sorry, please get booked by yourself. I would have said, okay, I would have gotten bookings like that. But when there's that lack of communication, what am I to do? So I went home, you know, I went down to, it was a WrestleCon down in, I think it was Miami or was it, was, what was 2017? Uh, it was Orlando, sorry. I Orlando, yeah. yeah. Orlando, yeah. Yeah. So I got booked randomly on a, on a New Japan tour. I think it was in July for like 10 days. And nobody emailed me except for Kamiko just to send me my flight information. And I was kind of mad at the office because there was absolutely no communication as far as when are we coming back? Are we coming back when Lance gets better? Is he actually going to come back? Is he going to be healthy enough? So I was on a tour with, came back on a tour in July and I called uh, Gato and Mr. Sugabayashi. I called them downstairs at Corican Hall and I asked them what the issue was and I explained to them my frustrations about what happened and the lack of communication. And I said, Gato son, I sent you an email. I sent you a Facebook message. I'm sorry. This is how you communicate with Lance. And he tried to, he lied to me. He's a liar. He said, oh, uh, Facebook, I don't know which, which Facebook. He kind of talks like Cartman from South Park. And he gave me the, and then talking in Japanese to Sugabayashi and they were pretending they didn't know how to speak English for about 30 seconds. And, uh, I said to Gato, I said, well, what's this? And I showed him the message and he pretended he didn't know. So I said, well, how do you, how do you communicate with Lance then? I looked him in the eye and he goes, oh, I don't know. I said, well, do you talk to him on Facebook, right? Uh, Facebook, I don't know. I said, well, Gato-san, I said, do you want me back here in New Japan or not? What's, what's, what's actually the story here? Okay, and he said, oh, well, when Lance gets better in September, you guys will come back. I want you guys to feud with War Machine and G.O.D. and I said okay and I said well what's the do story with this and all with Lance Archer's back injury and you know you guys there's been a lack of communication I just would have appreciated the honesty and if they would have communicated better and he apologized and he said we're sorry we didn't know so I said okay we shook hands we went off on that but ever since that day I think Gato was scared of me and he didn't want to communicate with me because Japanese are they don't like confrontations and they're very passive aggressive. And when I did that to him and Sugabayashi, I think that they got scared and I was mad because, hey, how can, who can blame me? I, you know, you, you want to, let's talk. Let's talk face to face, man to man. So after that, Gato, I don't think really liked it or appreciated it and too bad, I don't really care. But anyway, going forward after all this, um, there was a few issues. One was that there's been a ton of talent, gaijin talent, that's been coming into New Japan and there's been almost an overabundance of talent that's on the shows where you start getting into the situation where there's only 10, like, like 10 man tags, 8 man tags, 6 man tags. The only singles matches that are happening on tour, if there are any, are with the young boys to get them experience. And, uh, you know, my workload started going down. I mean, last year I was only booked on four tours and I had been contacted by Impact Wrestling to come and uh, start doing TVs here, out here in uh, where, wherever they're doing it in Ontario, Windsor. Windsor, yeah. With, and I had asked them and I said, and I asked them very nicely, I said, hey, I've been contacted because I'm Canadian, they want a new Canadian star, they want some fresh talent, they want something new. And it was all of a sudden like their eyes got all wide and it was like, oh, you don't want to leave us to go to them. I said, no, but if you guys are only booking me on four tours a year, I have to start doing things to better myself and better my career and get you know, me back on TV because the access TV stuff that they've been showing of myself has been garbage. It's been terrible. I've been, you know, they show these lousy eight man tags where I come in and do a lame power clothesline in the corner and then they do the deal where the baby face comes in for the comeback and blasts us off the apron and we're selling like for 10 minutes. You know, it's all the same crap and it just wasn't doing me any good. And I had, I had asked Gato and Giotto, who I actually like Giotto a lot. He was very nice to me. And 
I think he probably has a better business mind for wrestling than Gato. But that being said, you know, there was like, oh, well, fucking Jeff Jarrett and he fucked Okada over and fucking TNA and blah, blah, blah. This is just quotes. I, I don't want to swear too much on here. But I was going like, guys, Jeff Jarrett's gone. He's not in Impact Wrestling. I just got contacted. I'm asking you. You said no, so that's fine. That's that. So I went home, and Lance Archer had e emailed the new um, president, Harold Meiji. And then he said to Lance, he goes, well, we just figured that Davey Boy's going to Impact, and you guys were done. Like, the, he was, they weren't going to book us on any more tours. And Lance asked me about this because he goes, well, what's the deal? And I said, well, I, I approached them because I... They didn't ask about Lance and I coming in as a team. They asked, they wanted me to come in as a babyface. So I asked and they said no. And Gato had told this Harold Meiji that I was gonna that I was quitting and I was I was going to TNA and we were done. But he he there was miscommunication and he put words into my mouth that wasn't true. And I emailed Harold Meiji and I asked him, I said, hey, listen, this is the story I got asked. They said no, that's fine. But I never was threatening to quit. That that's all just um, stuff that's lost in translation and putting words in my mouth and one of the last things that really pissed me off about Gato was we were on a show it was a, just a, a, a town show for the World Tag League and we were wrestling G.O.D. and the deal was at the very end of the match I go to hit the ropes and Giotto hits me in the back with the cane the Singapore cane so I said fine and Tama hits me I go down he does something he hits the gun stun so when I hit the ropes it was just mistimed, one of those things. And Giotto hit me as hard as he could when I hit the ropes with the cane on my hand. And I swear, I thought I broke my hand because I, I don't know if anyone can see here. I broke my hand before in New Japan, actually, on a tour. And I was on this hand and it swelled up like that. And I, I bumped away and I just, like, I screamed like, And they, he did the finish. I rolled, to the, rolled out of the outside. I thought I broke my hand, like, you know. So I come to the back and right away Giotto is saying sorry he said oh Davey I'm so sorry and I went and saw trainer Mizawa who actually when I first broke this hand he was the one that tested it and he said no fracture no good and they were going well okay is it really fractured and I went to the hospital they did x-rays and it was broken so he looked at it and he did a test and he said no it's it'll be okay but it's it swelled up like that and it was red and man, if you ever if you get hit and, and it's not even a gimmick Singapore cane right on your hand like that it hurts and then Gato comes up to me and he's complaining that when I got hit in the back with the, the cane, I didn't sell long enough. And I'm here with this big giant bag of ice on my hand, like going like, and I couldn't grip or do anything for about five days. I had to keep ice on it. It hurt like hell. It was swelling during the middle of the night. And he was just complaining about that. He didn't even ask me how my hand was, you know? There's a big lack of respect with that, which I didn't appreciate, you know? And uh, right at the very end, you know, they started mistreating me and having me do jobs to guys like Yano. And I don't mind, I understand that this is a business. I don't mind going out there and pouring my heart out, giving the fans a great match and losing, that's fine. But when you're just out there to put me in matches with guys like Yano and we don't have good chemistry at all, then it's time to leave. And, you know, I felt that I don't know if you ever remember Devin, but do you remember when Van Vader was in WWF at the very end of his like his oh, yeah. tenure there? Of course. You know, and they were just jobbing him out. And the last time I'd seen him on TV, he was losing to Edge on uh, Sunday Night Heat. And it wasn't like Vader was doing a bad job there. It wasn't like he was not performing. It was just that his, uh, I guess, time in the company had expired or they didn't have anything more from storyline-wise. Why they didn't want to push me or have me do more stuff as a singles competitor there, I don't know. It was out of my control. And the last thing that happened on my, the last tour I was on was I had been contacted uh, by Real Japan Pro Wrestling, who's Satoru Sayama, the original Tiger Mask, and Hisashi Shima, who was the original president of New Japan Pro Wrestling back in the 80s, and they've started a company, and they were doing a Dynamite Kid tribute show. So they didn't, nobody ever told me about it. I just knew that they were doing it. I trained at Sayama's gym. They had contacted New Japan about borrowing me for a show. And I was told that New Japan, there was a bunch of back and forth discussion about it. And uh, you know, like that story or the, the saying goes, when you're dealing with business or you're buying a new car, there's always, there's strings attached. It was almost like 
I went to do this show, but it was like there was heat attached. And it wasn't my fault, but like all of a sudden it was like, for this tour, they were trying to make me look as bad as possible, having me lose going into this show. Um, and you know why that was, I don't know, but apparently Mr. Hattori has got heat with Shima or they don't like each other from Enoki and 35 years ago. I don't know what the deal is, but there was a definitely a different vibe on that tour. And I was told that New Japan had charged Real Japan some ridiculous amount of money. And they, nobody will tell me because Japanese are secretive. And they gave me a cut of it and it was, it was fine, but I don't know what they charged them, but I think that they charged them a lot and kept it. That was what I was told. And my last tour there, there was also questions about me doing the Ring of Honor show for WrestleMania weekend. And that is quite yeah, and I, you know, there was back and forth, like, we don't know, and it's like, well... Enzo got on it somehow, though. Yeah, <laughs> and, well, good for him, I guess, but, you know, the thing was, was that, like, I finally told them, because I said, I'm trying to f plan out my, that Mania weekend, like, with New York traffic and... You know, all these shows, I tell you, I did Bloodsport that weekend, two months worth of TV for MLW, Pancakes with Piledriver, some other afternoon show Ted booked me on. So I didn't really even want to be on it. And they, they didn't give me a definite answer. And honestly, I finally told them because Jim Neidhart was being inducted in the Hall of Fame, I was trying to figure out. I told them that I didn't want to do it. And I said, keep me off it, but you guys got to separate Lance and I, as far as being this package, like, I don't want to say I don't want to be on it. And that means Lance isn't going to be on it. I said, please keep, Lance, keep Archer son on it. I just don't want to be on it because I'm not going to be in a prominent role. I'm not saying this because I've got a big head. I would rather be there live in attendance for my uncle, Jim Neidhart, who I was very close to. I actually spoke at his funeral, one of the few people. I would rather be there than being put in some uh, lousy match that nobody's gonna even remember on a Ring of Honor show. I've had my moments in Madison Square Garden, opening up the show with Tyson Kidd. We had an awesome 15 minute match there once before. Bret Hart Appreciation Night, me, Tyson Kidd, and Bret versus the Nexus. One of the few times I got to team with Bret, I said, keep me off it, I don't, and I got heat over that too, like, because I had a big head. And I and I told Gato, because I, usually it would be Archer and I talking to Gato as a team about stuff. I just told him I wasn't happy. And I said, just, if you're only gonna offer me four tours a year, I have to look elsewhere for more work. And I said, I wasn't happy about the way I was being booked this, this last, this year. You know, I wasn't even on the main New Japan, uh, the Tokyo Dome show, we were on the undercard. Were you offered on this heavyweight tournament in Dallas that apparently didn't draw as well as they expected? No, I, th that was the that was the last the last thing that I had spoken to anyone was I had messaged Rocky, and I just wanted to make sure I wasn't on that show because I knew I wasn't coming back. Because here's the thing with business, I'm very very smart. I know how these companies think. I had MLW TV tapings that day, and I didn't really necessarily want to say that I was had MLW. I just was asking because. My thinking is if they know that they're getting rid of me, if they know I'm signed with MLW, because in my contract they said New Japan gets first bids, if they put me on the Dallas show and have me job out just to screw me on a month's worth of TV, they would do that. But they didn't, so that's good. But I was thinking, maybe overthinking, but Vince, you know, they would, they do, they would do stuff like that just to, hey, we're, we're going to use this guy one more time. Oh, well, it gets him out of doing MLW. He's being pushed. We'll just make him look bad. But they didn't, so that's it. And then... Um, you know, Devin, I had spoken to, I had approached John Laronitis, Johnny Ace, on some advice. Um, Johnny and I are good friends, and I have a lot of respect for him. And if I, I wouldn't approach somebody about advice if I didn't respect them and, and their business. And I knew he was a big star in Japan. And, and behind the scenes, a yeah, Finnish guy too, right? Yeah, very much so. So I had asked him his thoughts and I told him that I basically quit New Japan and I said I wanted to make an announcement before that they had announced that I was maybe, that they had fired me or pushed me out. And I had explained him the whole situation with everything. And what Johnny told me was, um, he, said, he said, no, don't announce that you quit. He goes, what you do is if you have offers, if you have Jim Ross that wants you in AEW, if you want, you know, Don Callis wants me in Impact Wrestling. I'm doing Major League Wrestling also. Um, you know, who knows if World of Sports coming back. But he said, just tell them that you have these other offers, and if they come back to you wanting you back, just tell them, say, 
you know, I want more money, I want more tours. That's how, you know, Johnny's voice is. And he told me that he did the same thing in 1996. And WWE had approached him about coming to, uh, or excuse me, WWF about coming there at the time. And he told me a mistake that I made, and that's fine. He told me you'd never ask the Japanese for anything. He said, you either let, it, let other people know about other things, let them ask you or approach you, and you tell them, yeah, well, I got offered this. He goes, everything, they'll either, if they, they can do ways where they, things get lost in translation, there's a lot of you know, shit disturbing backstage, a lot of bookers and bullshit. And he said, he said he did the same thing. He said, you just let people know through the grapevine that they want, that you're needed or you're wanted or wanted under contract. He said he never asked Baba about going to WWF in 96. He just said he let it through the grapevine. It was all over the wrestling uh, observer and everything. And then when he went on tour, he got off the bus and Baba had his head down. And then Johnny said, oh, Baba, you know, see my son and whatever. And, and then he said, Johnny, uh, I want you to stay all Japan. And he said, oh, yeah, I want to stay. And I guess Baba had asked Johnny about getting offers from WWF. And Johnny said, yeah, it's true, Baba. He said, I want to stay, but I need more money. I need, I need this, this, and this, and this. And he said he got it. And I'll tell you one thing, Johnny is a smart guy. I asked him what he was making per week in all Japan in his prime at the very end. And there's nobody, nobody in Japan now that's making what he's making a week. Nobody. And it's 20 years later. Yeah more than 20 years later. Yeah. I mean, Johnny's a businessman through and through. Whatever happened, you know, if people say bad things about him, here's the thing, it was just, he was just doing a job. You know, he was there to hire people and fire people and do some of the dirty work. But we had a long talk and Johnny told me, he gave, he gave me a perspective about this. And he told me, he goes, he said, I think that it's very good if you do go to AEW, he's not in position to hire or fire people anymore. But he said the, the thing that if you do go to AEW that they're missing is they're missing big guys. They're missing guys like myself, like a Johnny size or your size, you know. People, as much as there's great talent with smaller people, you do need big guys and you need big guys that know how to work. The other day on MLW, I just had a really, really awesome TV match with that Alex Hammerstone. It was just basic, it was solid, it was good. But that's what people really want to see, you know. They, they want to see guys like Hulk Owen. They want to see big guys. And that's, that's, what, that's what draws the most money. That's what he told me about what, what, how Baba was always successful. There was always the Steve Williams, Stan Hansen, Terry Gordy, Vader. Dan Spivey, Vader. And like I said, when I was talking to you about Vader before, when WWF was, you know, dogging him out or whatever, you know what he did? He went over to All Japan, restarted his career. He killed it over there. Those matches with Mizawa and Kabashi were amazing. He totally reinvented himself. I saw him throw in a few submission holds out there. He worked perfect. I mean, it was, it was great and it was a good thing that he left WWF. But why New Japan was doing that to me, other than Gato had a personal issue with me about things, I couldn't win. It was just, you know, that was the way it was, you know, and that's unfortunate, but that's the way that they were stone-headed about it. And personally, Devin, it's my honest opinion, and you'll probably agree with me on this, and fans, I've heard nothing but fans tell me that they prefer me and they like me as a singles player. And, you know, me with all the costumes that I've got with the Bulldog and this and that, and it's been great doing stuff with MLW, and I don't mean to keep... And your dad was a singles star as well. Exactly, you know, and I don't mean to keep dragging this on, but I believe I got heat from... New Japan also for signing with MLW too because they have this relationship with Ring of Honor. The problem was Ring of Honor was never booking me, you know? The only time that they would book me and Lance was if New Japan begged them and I don't wanna be an unwanted talent or one of those guys that's begging to date a girl or you, you, know, you understand what I mean? And I never even, cause you know, and I, I think I had told them that I'd sign with MLW but I said, this is in the contract and they got all confused asking what is MLW and are you quitting? And I was like, all right, no, just forget it. I'm here, I'm just, you know how it is with things getting lost in translation. But that being said, um, it's time for me now to train hard, be very, very focused, train harder than I ever have. I feel like I'm bigger than I ever have been right now. 
And I have uh, aspirations of taking a mixed martial arts fight. Now I'm back in Tampa, Florida. I've been sparring and training with uh, Jack Swagger. We're talking about going to the American top team down in Coconut Creek. And I have aspirations and I have faith in Court Bauer with Major League Wrestling. He's put a lot of stock into me. And the nice thing about Court is that he actually listens to me and my ideas. We've been really, um, you know, turning the page and doing some great things in that company as well. So I'm excited for the future. And I would like to do, as long as it doesn't interfere too much with the MLW contract, I would like to do something with AEW. I like Cody, I like the Bucks, I like Kenny. All those guys are great. They are missing big talent, big guys like myself. And I think I would be a great addition to them. Jim Ross is high on me very much. He wants me to, to join AEW or, or make appearances. Too yeah. On his podcast. Yeah, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but... My friend Dave Harrow, who's a promoter out in Milwaukee, told me he doesn't he didn't even tell Jim Ross he knows me. And Jim Ross told him that I'm the best he said Harry Smith is the best wrestler in the world right now. He said just nobody knows it, nobody's given him a chance. And Bret Hart said the same thing about me. I just want a chance to shine out there and prove myself, and I feel that MLW's done that. But I want to thank New Japan for the time that I spent with them. Unfortunately they didn't want to invest more in me than they did and they didn't want to do, they didn't want to expand on anything. You have to move on. So with MLW and Impact, is Impact kind of out of the picture now that AEW could be a possibility if MLW um, would do an agreement with them? Not necessarily. You see, Devin, what, what I have going on right now, like Johnny told me, he said, if you have all the cards in front of you, he said, play your cards very, very smart and think about things very, very, um, diligently and clearly really do a lot of research and investigate about what's going to be your next move i wouldn't say impacts out of the picture at all i would love to do stuff with impact i like um john morrison you know i saw michael elgin's recently gone over there um you know they got a lot of great talent i would love love to go over there as well uh, it's just the only thing is that i think court's open to it i think that the problem with court with mlw with uh, excuse me aw the, is that there's sort of a double-edged sword there and I believe that court the plan is for me going into the future is that I'm supposed to represent MLW and be the next world champion and he just doesn't want me going on to other TV products and not being used to my fullest potential or being misused I think that's what his issue is but I would love to do impact court's been working with them exchanging talent it's been going great so I would like to do it, and I'm curious what they might have in store for me. And for AEW, we've seen they've allowed some people to go for like one-time appearances, but from what I understand, MLW is only taping once or twice a month now, so yeah. there might not even be a conflict with AEW's TV tapings. Yeah, tapings. absolutely, that's, <clears throat> that's correct. I would love to do that, and you know that, you know, Devin, that's the thing is I don't understand what New Japan's deal was, was because there's so many of these double standards and and, uh, you know, like when Kenny and the Bucks and Cody were all jumping to, to start AEW, I was under the assumption that they all wanted to still work with New Japan and do something uh, internationally with them in the U.S. And then New Japan just totally said, no, you guys go away. We're, you're, we're done. We only work with Ring of Honor. But then they used John Moxley and Jericho, th who are still working with AEW. Why not keep Kenny and the Bucks when you've invested all that money and time into them? You, you understand what I mean? I, I, I it just I it, can, it confuses Kenny me now too that they they don't actually have him booked, although they could have him booked. Yeah, well, I, th that I don't know, but I just that always kind of uh, made me wonder. I'm, I'm not sure, but you know, there's there's so many things that New Japan could have done with me. Like, imagine if there was a G1 match with me and John Moxley or. Uh, you know, myself with Will Ospreay, who I think is an amazing talent as well. You know, uh, myself and Kota with uh, Ibushi, I think he's a great uh, talent. You know, I think that they just cheated the fans totally on what <clears throat> could have been some amazing matches just because they only wanted me to do a, as a tag team. And it just, I, I didn't get it. So, you know. As a wrestling expert, uh, I know you could possibly work for AEW in the future, but what are your thoughts on AEW so far from what you've seen? You've mentioned that there seems to be a lack of big guys, but overall, what do you, what do you think? Well, you know, I, 
<clears throat> Honestly speaking, I saw the first show. I've been wanting to see the, the last ones that they did in, was it Daytona Beach? I didn't see, I haven't seen yeah. that yet. There's I heard one it in Jacksonville too. Yeah, I, I heard that they weren't as good. I like the first show. There was some good and bad things. I think that AEW, one thing that they've changed since the first show that I like to have, to have seen was they've changed the colors a bit. I'm a big guy with colors, you know. Um, I thought that their championship belt was, uh, it could have been a bit more, like I like a gold championship belt with the diamonds and the rubies. Like this one was silver and he couldn't tell if it said AEW or NEW or NXT. I don't know if they invested a lot of money into that title. Hopefully not. I didn't like the title. I didn't like the colors for the first show. Uh, I like that they changed the colors on the turnbuckles. And people may think, oh, well, that doesn't mean a lot. Yeah, it does mean a lot. Uh, WCW, I like their, their colors because it was totally different from WWE. I like ECW's colors. But that, that all being said, I didn't like the Battle Royal on the first show. I thought it was a waste of time, but... I understand that they were wanting to do something where they had um, an abundance of talent out there just to, you know, almost like as an infomercial or as a commercial just to have them out there or a reason to be out there. I thought the Battle Royal sucked. I thought it was a waste of time and I wouldn't have done it. But what do I know? But uh, there was a lot of good stuff. Going back to the colors, Dustin and Cody had an amazing match. Because of Dustin with the red and the dark suit, I would have liked to have seen him wearing something else. I think that the blood would have uh, showed up better. It was a hell of a cut, but it was a great match. A very good match, too. And um, by that being said, I, th I think that they're, they're on the right path. I think they're doing a lot of good stuff. Um, you know, like I said, hopefully we were able to negotiate something and, and work something out. I would like to go there. I'm, I'm very intrigued by what they're doing. There's a fan question for you here asking sure. if you think pro wrestling could ever be respected like a sport such as American football again with some of the goofiness that's gone on in recent years. Uh, well, I think, oh, that's a, I don't want to blank, make a blanket statement here, but I think that uh, it will always be respected to some degree, but I think it's always going to be sports entertainment. I don't think it'll ever be respected as uh, a sport like the NFL or even UFC. There's just too many guys that are, and you know, it's just the, it's the way it is. It's sports entertainment. I don't think so, but hey, you never know. Have you had any talks with Bellator yourself lately? It seems uh, they might be interested. Yeah, in I. You know what? I I haven't quite yet, but my main thing is, um, you can see a couple marks on my faces. I just on my face. I just started training back again. I was a little bit out of shape with all of this move back down to Tampa. Uh, I need to be back in the training room and I need to be back in the training room all summer and training again and, and getting in shape. So yes, I am interested. I haven't really spoken with them yet. Uh, I need to be back in California training with Josh Barnett again, um, getting myself ready. And I would like to, just we haven't spoken yet. Would you like to have matches like uh, Jack Swagger where they're kind of bringing him along up easily or be thrown right away into the, uh, a fight against a seasoned opponent like they did with CM Punk in his first fight? Yeah, well, the thing is, I think they did it good with Jack or Jake, whatever. Um, yeah, Jake Hager. Jake Hager, yeah. yeah. So I think that it's good to give him some opponents that he starts getting experience and he's getting that live fight time. You know, I think that years ago, New Japan had kind of messed up and they threw Yuji Nagata, unfortunately, to the Wolves with guys like Mirko Krokop in his first MMA fight and Fedor with like two weeks notice. And, you know, how was he ever going to win those? Uh, same with Ishizawa, to, uh, Kendo Kashin. He got thrown in there with Hyan Gracie, who was, you know, in the prime of his career and an absolute predator on two weeks notice. How, how was he going to win that, you know? And then Ishizawa came back a year later and... and TKO'd him so good on him but I think that it's important it's good to give him uh, you know I don't know the skill levels of his opponents but you don't want to give him tomato cans but you want to give him guys that he can fight and start building his name up and building his uh, his fight record to start fighting you know guys like Frank Mir whoever I don't know who the 
top heavyweights are in Bellator currently, like, because it, it's always changing every day, you know what I mean? So yeah, I, I, I do think so. This is a good question. Now, I know Georgia Dath dated Nathan for a bit. I don't really consider him a wrestler, but someone has a question on here. Now that Georgia is working for MLW, would you have an issue with her going out with a pro wrestler? No, no. I wouldn't have an issue as long as he treated her good and it was a nice relationship. No, uh, no problems there. I'm not sure if I understand this question. You might, but uh -huh. can you talk about the NWA feeling on winning the belts, Bruce Tharp, ECT? Well, I don't know if I can really touch base on that because I'm not sure what the question is. I will say this. Billy Corgan is a close friend of mine, and I know that he was wanting to uh, ascertain me for the NWA, and he was wanting to breed me as the, the new champion, which I think is a good, a great idea. I should be the champion there, honestly. Who's? I'll ag I would actually agree with that. Yeah. You know, like I can go out there and wrestle, you know, like Ric Flair style for 60 minutes on the, you know, if it's on the fly, or if we're doing, a, I can wrestle like a technical Bret Hart style match. So I think that I would fit into the NWA. I talked with Dave Lagana a bit. I don't know if there's an issue that he has with me, but he's kind of been um, apprehensive with returning my text, so I'm not going to push the issue on it. But Billy and I are close, and he does want me there. Bruce Tharp, I have no idea about. Um, he has nice jackets and good sunglasses, and I like Bruce, but I don't know what his affiliation with the NWA is anymore or if he still has any. But Bruce is a good guy, and... He owned it, it prior to Billy Corgan. Yeah. That's all I know from my brief meeting of, with him. Yeah. Um, now that Jim Neidhart's been inducted in the WWE, I guess the next guy theoretically from your family should be your father. Any yeah. thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think that when the time is right, whenever that time is, I don't know. He should already be in the WWE based on talent and his uh, accomplishments and attributes and everything he contributed to the company why he isn't I don't know that's a tough one because I know that everybody's always asked me about Owen Hart as well Davey should be in the Hall of Fame I don't know if they were waiting not not to sound bad but if they were waiting for Dynamite to pass to induct them both at the same time or one or the other there's obviously um, the, him and Davey him and Owen are both conspicuous by their absence but there's I, reasons I don't for Owen, like your mother yeah. and you are not opposed to Davey going in. No, and I'm not opposed to Owen going in. He should be in. And you know what? Honestly, I, I ran into Martha at a tanning salon, the widow of Owen Hart, and she was very nice. And um, it, I was, I assume, or I, what I've been told through mutual friends from Martha, that she's not even that, she's not even opposed to him going into the Hall of Fame. Because here's the, th here's the thing, WWE, like it or not, they do whatever they want pretty much, and they, there's legal issues and this and that, but I don't even think she even so much cares about it, but like what, what was stopping, sh there was obviously issues with the, the Owen Hart DVD, they haven't made any merchandise of him, but they did make the DVD of him, so my thought is if they made a DVD of him, surely they can make a inductive in the Hall of Fame. Because WWE, they were, you know, they made so much money off that DVD. They got 90, the 95% and they give 5% to Martha. So what's going to stop them from inducting him in the Hall of Fame? Does she, does she really want to, at this stage in the game, go through a legal battle with them? I don't even think she's, not that she doesn't care, but I, I, I think that it's almost like an excuse because I haven't heard Martha personally say that she's in, she's opposed to him going into the Hall of Fame. But, and at the same time, if she is, I respect that and I understand where her position is and I can't argue it you know she lost her husband it was a lousy thing and if that is so the case then so be it but I, I don't think it really is I don't think anybody's communicated to her well enough and I think that she may be open to it I don't know now this is a question you don't have to give a detailed answer on this but mm -hmm. someone's asking What's the difference between the rigors on the road in Japan compared to being with the WWF, for example? Well, yeah. You see, the thing is, I'll give New Japan this, because a lot of people will, 
I think that it was a lot harder of a schedule back in the 80s when my dad and Dynamite Kid were there and there was a lot more kayfabe and um, guys were stiffer with each other. There's a lot of long bus rides. There's some cold arenas, but like I said, the last time I was, like the last year or so I was on tours of Japan, in New Japan, excuse me, the work wasn't exactly hard. It just wasn't, um, there wasn't really a challenge to it. And that being said was that, you know, you're in eight man tags or 10 man tags. You know, I like to go out there and I like to have a hard tour and at the end feel like you gave it your all. You know, if it's a G1 climax, those are a lot tougher. But that being said, New Japan's expanded their tours to make to cater to the talent, which I think is very good. You know, years ago when I was in the first uh, G1 climax in 2013, I think they did 13 days with uh with 12 show like the the block was 12 12 shows, and we had like one day or two days off, and it was in the heat of the summer in August. I mean, guys were getting injured left, right, and center. And that was another thing that I'll go back to when we were talking about New Japan before, was when I had come back, I was jacked and you know lean and I was healthy. And when they just totally said, no, we're not gonna book you. And it was like, well, you have all these guys on the, the G1 Climax, like when I did that tour in July, like Shibata's, he's, he's wrapped up like a mummy backstage and he's getting the needles in his back and he's walking around like an 80 year old man. And I was specifically told on, on tour in that, um, don't even touch him. He's that injured and that messed up. Don't punch him, don't do anything. He's, he's just in there to come in and out, do a spot. Goto was like that. Um, uh, Tomohiro Ishii, or he was like that too. And it's like, well, why don't you give these guys a break and have someone like myself come on to, for a G1 climax. And it's like, look, Shibata's, he had that crack skull there's guys getting injured left right and center Hiromo Takahashi got injured I'm concerned for the safety of guys with a lot of these goofy head bumps that they're doing so that being said the WWE schedule it's like six half dozen the other um they're hard in both ways New Japan you get to go home you get to rest guys that are on tour the Japanese boys on every single tour day tour in tour out they're getting it a lot worse and they don't get to recover as well. So, but the WWE travel schedule is not to be laughed at, it's really hard. So, and going back to what I was talking about, that first G1 climax I was on, I mean, I remember one time I was so tired, I worked Tanahashi and he gave me, he does a left-handed slap. He gave it to me and I, anybody that gets hit hard in boxing or MMA or, he, it was one of those ones where he hit me so hard where I was like, it like was like, I sh shook the cobwebs up and it was like, I wanted to knock him out. <laughs> and he hit me and I was like, wow. And I, d I didn't do anything. We kept on the match and I was like, man, he, I I'm wondering if he could have hit me harder. <laughs> so then the next day, Tanahashi was working with Goto. He hit him with that left hand, same left handed slap. It's not even a slap, it's like a palm strike. He, uh, he broke Goto's jaw in half. Goto was out for about four or five months. Wow. That's to show you that pro wrestling over in Japan is no joke even. So I, I'm, my jaw's pretty good for hits like that. But that being said, G1 Climax, when there's times like that, the competition gets stiffer, it gets harder. They've stretched it out longer nowadays. So WWE or New Japan, what's harder? I don't know, they're both the same. If, and they're both hard work. Any chance of you teaming up with Bronwyn for a mixed tag as a tribute to your fathers? Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I would like to. I, I don't think Bronwyn's... She'll probably admit this too. She hasn't had enough training or anything. However, I, having Bronwyn manage me to the ring would be a nice tribute. Um, lately, I've been doing some stuff. I've been coming off the top rope with the diving headbutt, like Dynamite Kid. As a, as a tribute, and it's been working, and it's been good. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll go back to that. Another little argument with, you know, like my thought was when Dynamite passed away, I was on a New Japan tour, and it was very, it was hard for me to hear because I was on tour, and, you know, he died on his birthday, and I know his daughter was sad. And it was like the final day they were doing a Dynamite Kid tribute, 
um, a ten bell salute, and they played his entrance music. And you know, it was like I thought it would have been better if Lance Archer and I came out because we didn't do very good in the tag league point system wise. We were losing. I said, you know, why don't we come out and wrestle with the young boys? And you know, I do the diving headbutt or do a nice tribute. We go over strong, come out, we do the thing for Dynamite, we'll play his music and. The Gato wanted, he didn't want to change it. He wanted to do uh, like some six man or eight man tag with Michael Elgin and uh, Chuck E.T. and Trent Beretta because, and he's like, yeah, Chuck E.T. hit you with the chair and he's going to go crazy like Ken Shamrock. And I was going, yeah, Chuck E.T. going crazy like Ken Shamrock? I mean, who are we trying to kid here? I like Chuck E.T. I'm just saying he's not the right guy for that role. He doesn't look like Ken Shamrock and he's not a shoot fighter. He's, I don't know if. I think Ken was, could play that role because I think he was a bit half nuts. But that being said, he just, and it was like, well, who really got over out of any of that? And then Chuck E.T. went and left off to AEW. And it's like, you invested all this time, but you're just letting these talent go because you don't want to, you don't want to pay them more. Or you don't want to, because you, you think that you can just make new stars. And it's like, I think that the, Trent Beretta was another good talent that he just let go. It's like, why didn't, why didn't you at least try to keep him or negotiate something? But that being said, we'll move on to whatever the next question You have a few Scottish uh, fans on here asking when you're coming back to Scotland and will you work for ICW? I hope I can come back to Scotland. I have no idea if I will work for ICW. I would like to, um, as long as, you know, as long as I have a good opponent and the promoter pays me. I, I love, Scotland's a very nice place. I hope I can come back over to the UK soon. My grandfather, um, who's my dad's dad, he just turned 81 years old and he's still in great shape. And it would be awesome to come over and see him again and see my UK fans. So I hope to be back over in Europe again soon too. Speaking of UK, a, a fan on here had a question about sure. uh, your relationship with Billy Robinson, which reminds me, I got to ask you this yeah. because you saw this. Yeah. Sergeant Slaughter's claim that he beat Billy Robinson at a shoot. Yeah, so I'll, I'll explain it like this. Um, so going back years when Sarge was in WWE, he was always very, very unfriendly to me, and he was never he never really had a lot of uh, great advice. He always seemed kind of uninspired and uh, was uninspiring to the talent. And then I had heard that, and you know what? The if If Sarge did, then good on him. The only way I would see that happening is if maybe Billy got too drunk and started, you know, some, something escalated, like what happened with him and Sailor White. And maybe he, you know, got put in his place. The only other person, the, the only person I've heard from was through Sarge. But I will say this. Uh, I saw Sarge at WrestleMania this last year, and he came up and grabbed me from behind and gave me a hug and told me he's been watching me and said I was doing a great job. And I appreciated it. I don't know if somebody told him that maybe I said he wasn't friendly to me, but he was he was extra nice, like almost went out of his way, which I appreciated. And it was cool that he came and and, and was very nice to me and he gave me a nice encomium with, with his statement about uh, how I'm doing a great job. And I wish Sarge all the best. I heard he had a double hip replacement. But if, if he did beat Billy, then Sarge, I guess, is... He's on Olympic level or a level like Hicks and Gracie to beat Billy Robinson. Because I think Billy's technique was phenomenal. If Sarge did, then he's a tough SOB, I suppose. The, o the only person that I heard Billy really put over as far as being a shooter pro wrestling wise was Baron Von Roschke. And I, heard, I saw an interview where Baron said that uh, Billy tried to shoot on him in the ring and he, they had a scramble and he came out on top. That I could believe because Billy touted him as being absolutely 100% legit. So that could be true. I never heard anything else about Sarge. And last fan question, I'll ask fans watching this. This is being recorded with the cell phone. The high quality version will be posted when I post the, the full thing that includes Davy Boy Smith Jr. explaining why he left New Japan. But someone's asking what your favorite uh, opponent was and who you would like to wrestle in the future most. Yeah, you know what? Going back to when we were d talking about a lot of my great stuff that I've been doing, I love that, that blood sport match that I had with Killer Cross. Josh Barnett's a GCW blood sport. 
It was really, really awesome. And the, the beauty of these matches that I've done with guys like Killer Cross. And, the, and the, first off, I want to thank Killer Cross because he was the one that requested to wrestle me. And I really appreciate that he thought so highly of me to step in the ring with me. And I, and I do feel that I'm, I'm at that uh, one of the level of the men, I like to call it. It was a great match. We only talked about it for about five minutes. We just went in there and wrestled each other, wrestled stiff. I want to say it was almost maybe my favorite match that I've had. And it was a different atmosphere with the ropes taken down. So I, I want to almost go with that. I believe I'll be on the next GCW Blood Sports show September 15th. I don't know who I'll be, who my opponent will be, but it will be interesting if it's Josh Barnett or I don't know if he's, what his plan is, if he's bringing any talent over from Japan. So at the moment, my favorite match of mine is Blood Sport. Please check that out on Fight TV. It was on YouTube, but it did get taken down, and I understand they want people to subscribe, so it's definitely worth the money to watch that for sure. And the opponent you would most like to face? Yes. Uh, oh, geez. You know what? Masakatsu Funaki, if, if it could happen. You know, Devin, when we were talking earlier about the Dynamite Kid tribute show, uh, I wrestled, it was myself and the new Super Tiger, uh, Yuji Sakuragi versus Kenzo Suzuki and Masa Funaki. And I'll tell you, Masakatsu Funaki is 50 years old, and that guy can still go. I believe he could go in a ring right now and, and fight MMA, and he could beat a lot of guys. Wow. He's in good shape. He has, Funaki's hands, he's, he's really strong. Like he's got a weird frame like in his body like his hands his fingers are like that like he's got a huge and his grip is really really strong and i went out for to eat and had drinks with funaki before in osaka and we had a lot of we had a good time but when he appeared in the ring with me for the real japan show in Corken hall i sensed that there was a different spirit in the ring with me and there was a different aura about himself and he was very, very serious. And he was, he was stiff, but it was a good stiff. And I think that when you're able to have that certain kind of aura, like I would say, for instance, Devin, if you were to see Hulk Hogan here and talk to him, and when you are in the ring with him, there's a different kind of, they bring a different kind of uh, Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Them, you know, yeah. and Funaki really had that. And, and, and um, he's he's tough, man. He's strong, and I, you know, actually, Hicks and Gracie had said that about Funaki as well. He said that he had sensed a different spirit that was that he had met in the ring to fight than the one that he had, you know, done the press conferences with and everything. And he put over Funaki, and he just said that. Unfortunately, Funaki lost by rear rear naked choke. But also, people don't know the story, but he had dislocated his kneecap when Hickson did a up kick from his back. And I almost wonder if that up kick didn't happen because he, he couldn't, when they went back to standing, he couldn't block the takedown. If he would have been able to beat Hickson, I, I don't know, but, um, you know, he's, he definitely has a very different aura. I would put over Funaki as being one of the best in the world today. I wish that he was publicized as much as Minoru Suzuki is. And I definitely do feel that Minoru Suzuki, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, when he goes to the ring, he brings a different spirit and a different aura and a different ambience, ambience to himself as well. And that, that separates the amateurs from the pros, I suppose. And you gave this to me off camera, but uh, if you were Billy Jack Haynes standing in front of me right now, what would you say? <laughs> oh, well, you know, Devin, as far as shoots go, I've done enough of them. You're the best. What can I say? Well, when he was when he was interviewing you, and uh, <laughs> you were interviewing him, and and oh, uh, well, you know, you're the best. Uh, what was some of his other stuff? How have you had any contact with him at all, or it's all, is it, uh, that's just the, under the water? At one point, the Rob Feinstein was going to book that at his ECW Arena show. Uh, but I don't have much interest in, yeah, in wrestling that guy. Um, he's not healthy, unfortunately. Yeah, he's got hepatitis. But hey, I wish him all the best. I, uh, you know, I knew as well as a heart condition, and he yeah. needs a hip replacement. So poor guy. <laughs> yeah, I do feel bad for him. Um, What's your favorite impression to do? Ooh, um, 
You know, I was, I was getting good with dynamites because he was just very uh, <laughs> one word answered, you know? Like when I asked him about uh, Hoshino from New Japan when they had the, they had that little scuffle in the shoot, and he's like, he was like, yeah, he's a prick. He's a prick. And so I put a arm in, uh, put him in a grommet, and uh, you know, just tried to bite me. So, you know, I put it on him, and uh, that was it. You know. But he, he was just very one word answered. And like I remember, I asked Dynamite about. Uh, like the original Tiger Mask, I asked him, hey Tommy, what about the original Tiger Mask Sam? He says, hello, and what do you think about him? He goes, uh, he's the best. And then, oh, you'll find this funny, Devin. I know you recently interviewed Dan Spivey. Yes. And him and Dynamite were very <laughs> good friends. And uh, I had seen Tommy and I told him that Dan Spivey had said hi, and I, I don't think they had spoken in years. And I know that they were close friends, and the only thing that Dynamite said with his dry British sense of humor was, they said, yeah, Tommy, you know, Dan Spivey said to say hi. He said, uh, oh, yeah? I said, yeah, he, he wants your number and, you know, wants to talk to you. He goes, yeah, is he still daft? <laughs> In English, is he? And I started laughing. I said, yeah, well, he's, he's doing good. And he goes, oh, uh, right. And he just sipped away at whatever, and that was it. He didn't ask about how dance five he was, or you know, just is he is he still left? Yeah. All I can say is I hope that we see Wayland Mercy on TV again. I know they're doing, they're using him as the hand puppet or whatever, but yeah, uh, to see him actually appear would actually make me watch it. Yeah. <laughs> You know what, in closing here, Devin, I don't know if any of the fans... Oh, there's one last thing I got to ask you yep. before you close sure. this, because who knows, he might actually pass away in the next couple of days, mm -hmm. and I know you love him probably as much as I do as Harley Race. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, he's been in the hospital for eight or nine days now. Yeah, he, unfortunately, yeah. he was driving to a booking, and he's not even at home, so he's at a hospital, Yeah, like... It's really sad, actually. Ooh, you know what? That is too bad. I <clears throat> Hopefully I he'll pull through. He's yeah. fighting, but yeah. it's not looking good. Jeez, that is too bad. Yeah. You know what? I don't know what to say. I, you know what? My prayers, my thoughts are with him. I know my grandfather, Stu, really loved Harley, and he really respected him. I know Do Tommy Dynamite was um, a dear friend of Harley's and <clears throat> kind of thought of Harley as maybe an uncle figure to him. Man, I, I, wish, I wish him all the best, but you know, that's, I know that Harley had a rough time with um, his wife passing away. I also, I want to send out uh, my thoughts and prayers to Terry Funk, who recently lost his, uh, his wife as well. I haven't been in touch with Terry, if, but that just, if anyone speaks to him, I hope he's doing okay. And I know that uh, I had heard that he took that uh rather you know he he took that bad so oh harley i hope i hope he does well i hope he pulls through but you know if you're saying that maybe he only has a few days left i mean i don't know what to say you know that's well, that's too bad well i'm praying myself that that he pulls yeah. through and apparently uh if you go on his website they're looking for people to buy shirts yeah. to help pay for his family to come to the hospital unfortunately well another impersonation i heard <clears throat> that harley used to do was um He'd be talking to whoever he's working, and he 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 had amazing cardio for a guy that smoked like a chimney. <laughs> and I heard that he'd say, "All right, kid, so what's your finish?" And the guy says, "Well, I do a splash off the top rope or something." He goes, "Okay, I'll move belly to belly suplex." That would just be like that. He'd always ask, what's your finish? I'll move. <laughs> Harley Race. And then that was uh, Dusty Rhodes. He, he gave me that, too. He told me a story um, years ago about the spot. He said that uh, I think King Kong Bundy had come to WWF in maybe it was late 70s, early 80s. when It was, it was back when they were before. I think Bundy may even had hair at the time. Yeah. Well, then, and, God rest his soul, Bundy. Just I'm just using this as an example. And he said, because I can do Dusty's impersonation too, he goes, uh, you know, King Kong Bundy came up to me and uh, he asked if uh, maybe he could work in a spot. 
I said, oh yeah, you want a, you want a spot? He said, well, you know, I, I can do this and that. And I said, uh, I said, you know, when I give you that elbow, you take that bump, you lay right down there, and that's your spot. I'll drop the elbow and that's it. All right, kid? He said, all right. But the way he always said it, he said, that's your spot. <laughs> and then, yeah, but I really miss Dusty a lot. Um, I've been kind of trying to work on his impersonation only as a, as a compliment to him. But Dusty was, uh, you know, he really helped me out a lot on promos. And I like uh, Cody and Dustin a lot too. And I wish that uh, Dusty was still around to be a part of AEW, but I believe he's there in spirit as well. And he really contributed a lot to the, uh, the business, and he really believed in me, and I always appreciated that. So God rest his soul to Dusty and uh, really miss the guy. And I'll let you wrap it up here. Thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to speak with us. We've been getting that question everywhere, as I'm sure you have, yeah. why you left, and you gave an extremely detailed answer, so we appreciate that. Yes, thank you very much for the listeners that were tuning in. Um, I also want to thank the fan support because I've gotten a lot of uh, support on Instagram and Twitter and from fans that have respected me for um, my decision to leave New Japan and my f future aspirations. Um, thank you very much. Like I've said before, we would be nowhere without the fans of professional wrestling. It was great being back here in Hamilton tonight. and. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my fans in Japan. I can't say anything quite yet, but I will be back in Japan soon, I believe. And there's negotiations between myself and different companies over there. And I hope to be back. I love Japan a lot. There's a lot of great fans. And there's a lot of great talent that's still over there that I haven't been able to wrestle with. Actually, Devin, when you were asking me about guys that I wanted to wrestle, I want to add uh, Miyahara from All Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, he's a really awesome talent, and Jun Akiyama. And also, one day, hopefully, I can have a singles game with Minoru Suzuki, maybe a Bloodsport-style rules match. And I want to also thank Minoru Suzuki for all of his help that he's given me and his advice and the techniques he would uh, show me when I was on tour with New Japan Pro Wrestling. And he always went out of his way to help Suzuki Goon, and I really appreciate all of the help that he gave me. And I hope to see him soon, and hopefully it's in a game. And uh, thanks to the listeners. And you're on Twitter. Absolutely. I'm on Twitter at DB Smith Jr. On Instagram at DB Smith Jr. as well. Please follow and support. And I apologize if I can't get back to all my fans' questions or messages. But I do do my best. And, um, yeah, you can follow me on the Hannibal TV here. And I'm back here in October. Yeah, October 20th. We'll be October seeing you 20th. in Ottawa. Absolutely. Well, finish that off with the British Bulldog quote. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know what I could... Uh, What's going to happen to Jeremy Prophet or Nathan Banner? Um, did you want me to actually imitate? Did yeah. You? Oh, gosh. I don't. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know what I can say, but you know what, Devin? We were actually, we were just watching, uh, <laughs> we were watching, you remember Beach Blast 93? Of course, you yeah, heard with, it. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, you know. I remember Davey was so funny that day because we, we, I, I, I took it as I was so excited to go out there because one, I, I got to miss the day of school and two, I got to go out on the beach and see Vader and be a part of this big thing. And yeah. I remember Ole Anderson was the one with the camera and he was doing the directing of that whole schmuck. Wow, that $50,000 Probo. Oh yeah, and you know what? It's also, only... <laughs> you, th this is where the, 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 the story, the part that I'm trying to get to is all those kids that were, it was me, Jenny, and I think uh, my sister, Georgia. Yeah. And those other, like the, the girls and the guys doing the, uh, with the volleyball, they were all paid actors. They were all getting like, I don't know, uh, 75 bucks an hour or something. And I remember Davey was just laughing at it. He goes, oh, fuck. He goes, you could have gotten uh, Ari and Georgia's friends from school out here for free. You know, I was, I was laughing. I said, I said, yeah, man. They would And they would have loved it too, you know, if you just would have given them a, a free picture or got to meet the wrestlers, you know. But just the way he said it, he goes, you know, they just wasted a bunch of money, you know, fuck. Could have gotten Ari and George's friends out here for free. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. 
Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.